Good morning, this is Mark Matsky, pastor at St. Mark Lutheran Church in Chesterland, Ohio. We are going through a Bible study currently entitled Fearless Prayers, and it is based on the Psalms. We've been looking at various Psalms and the way that they serve as a, uh, a method of prayer for us, both in the words that we speak and in the patterns that they introduce us to. And I don't have to tell you, these are serious times in which we are living, uh, pushed in on many different sides by all sorts of concerns and cares, and, and so many of them um, touching our hearts in ways that bring us uh, to our knees in, in great humility. And the Psalms are written for people under pressure and facing a great deal of stress and anxiety and worry, and they speak directly to us uh, in those situations. That's why I'm particularly uh, excited to share with you today uh, a study on the 23rd Psalm. The 23rd Psalm is perhaps the most well-known portion of the Bible. It is uh, a psalm that people expect to hear, I think, on occasions such as a funeral service. And many times, even if you're watching a movie or a television show that is decidedly not um, written from a Christian perspective necessarily, if there is an event that's portrayed such as a funeral or a burial, you will hear snippets of the 23rd Psalm being read by the pastor or the priest. And that just goes to show how deeply the words of the 23rd Psalm have taken up residence in the popular mindset. Even if a person is not of a Christian uh, faith perspective, chances are they know some portion or have at least heard uh, the text of the 23rd Psalm being used in a situation such as that. So what I'd like to do today is just walk through the 23rd Psalm and see if there are some ways that uh, we can look at this with fresh eyes. There are a number of wonderful resources that are out there that help us to do just that. One of those that I'll turn to a few times today in my discussion of this particular Psalm is a book entitled A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by an author named Philip Keller, who was a shepherd himself and brings a shepherding perspective to a lot of what this psalm has to say. And so I will draw on that a couple times and I'll let you know when I'm relying on Philip Keller in order to reach some of the suggestions or conclusions that he does, which I think will, will help to unfold the psalm for us in a very helpful way. Before we dive into the text, let's begin with a word of prayer. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you today truly humbled by the, the great pressures and problems that we are facing at this time between civil unrest, a pandemic, and whatever personal struggles and issues we may be dealing with, we may feel pressed down and weighed down and beset by all sorts of anxieties and worries. We thank you for this opportunity to meet together in your word, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak truth to our hearts, would deliver your peace to us. And I Believe that you will do that as we are reminded of your great shepherding power. How you displayed that throughout your history with your people, and most especially how you displayed that through the words and deeds of our Savior Jesus Christ, who is the Good Shepherd of the sheep. I thank you, Lord, for everyone who is watching this at this time, uh, who will be watching this in the future. Lord, please touch their hearts with your word so that they would lay their burdens down and would be led to green pastures and quiet waters, which exist 
wherever you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so let's get into the text itself. We are in Psalm 23, of course, and I will read uh, the entire psalm, then we'll walk back through it verse by verse. This is from the English Standard Version of the Holy Bible. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is God's word. Again, this is one of the most well-known portions of the entire Bible. And it is just beloved uh, by faithful Christians. It has been down through the centuries. Uh, this psalm has given rise to a number of very dearly loved hymns, as is often the case when there is a dearly cherished portion of Scripture that typically ends up becoming a song of God's people. And I've already seen in a few of the comments, as I'm able to pay attention to them as they go by, that this is a, a, fair, a favorite and cherished psalm of yours as well. And it's easy to see why that is. Because, as one commentator put it, this psalm does such an excellent job of displaying the heart of God towards us, uh, who are his sheep. But not just that, we are also his dearly treasured and honored guests at an important celebration. And so we'll see the flow of how the psalm unfolds and leads us through section by section, just making one beautiful promise after another. Now the psalm begins in verse 1 by setting the stage immediately by just a, a simple statement. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What's really interesting and intriguing, and this is why uh, we are are led to uh, at least have pastors look at original languages because sometimes it, it unfolds and unpacks uh, a little extra portion of meaning for us. When it says the Lord, uh, in the original Hebrew text, it actually has the word or the name, I should say, of Yahweh. So to read it literally would say, Yahweh is my shepherd. The name Yahweh goes back to Exodus uh, chapter 3, where God introduces himself to Moses, and he calls himself, I am who I am, which there's a lot there to consider. It, it deals with God's, uh, the, always the truth of his presence. The, the truth of his being is that anywhere on the timeline, God is there, whether that's past, present, or future, God is who he is, and Yahweh is the, the, how it would have sounded to Moses in describing God's nature to him in a name. So it's actually God's proper personal name that appears in the 23rd Psalm. Yahweh is my shepherd. That name, Yahweh, is used 6,820 times across the Bible to designate God, uh, to introduce him, to say that he is the one doing the action. Now, the way that we ended up in our English translations with the word, the Lord, there, typically in all capital letters, 
is that during what's called the intertestamental period, or the time that elapsed between what we consider the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New, uh, many Jewish writers became uncomfortable using the personal name of Yahweh because they did not want to uh, trespass or transgress the second commandment, which was to misuse the name of the Lord. So to sort of safeguard the second commandment, they replaced the, the personal name of God with another word, Adonai, which means the Lord. The thinking being, if we use that name, then we will not ever have a chance of misusing the given name or God's personal name because we just won't say it. So I'm not here to argue whether or not that was a good idea, but simply to say that's why in Scripture today we have the Lord in all capital letters. That is, to the, the word that's based on is Adonai, which does mean the Lord, but what appears in the original text is the Hebrew name Yahweh. I am who I am. And so what's so key here is for us to understand that that's the God who has, that David is saying, that's my shepherd. The almighty creative God who always has been, who is now and always will be. He is shepherding me. And because that's true, the immediate conclusion that David comes to in verse 1 is, I shall not want. Since it's true that Yahweh is my shepherd, I am who I am, the God of Israel is shepherding me, I shall not want, I shall not lack anything. Being a good shepherd, he knows exactly what the sheep need and will provide that at the perfect time in every circumstance. So in a way, you could end the psalm right there and say, oh, that's uh, something I can keep in my pocket for the rest of the day, and that will give me great strength. But the rest of the psalm, at least uh, up and going through the valley of the shadow of death, is all really tightly constructed around this very idea of shepherding and the things that are included with that. Such as, verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Both of those things directly relate to the relationship between shepherd and sheep, and especially what sheep need in order to not only survive, but thrive. And that's at the heart of the entire psalm, is this idea that a good shepherd is not just hoping that his sheep will make it, will survive uh, through a season, but a good shepherd knows exactly what to do in order to make sure that his sheep aren't just living, but that they are thriving, that they are doing as best as they possibly can by taking steps to provide for them. One of those steps is green pastures. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to uh, walking in the way of righteousness. But for right now, I'll just say this, and this is a point that I drew out of Philip Keller. That is, green pastures don't happen by accident. A good shepherd has spent some time both scouting and cultivating the best places for his flock to go. And I'll return to that point in a little bit. But what I wanted to say here, and this too comes right out of Philip Keller, is that as a shepherd, in his experience, he's able to say, um, in his estimation, that there are four things that sheep need in order to feel comfortable enough to lie down, which is what verse 2 is all about. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What Philip Keller says is that you need four things in order for sheep to feel comfortable enough to do that. And he describes it this way. In order for sheep to lie down, number one, they need to be free from fear. Fear of predators, uh, fear in some ways of each other, which is related to point number two. They need to be free from friction within the community of sheep. 
because sheep can start butting heads very quickly. There's a, a established pecking order among the sheep. Number three, they need to be free from pests and flies in particular. And number four, they need to be free from hunger. And only then, when those things are met, are, do sheep feel at ease enough to actually lie down and be at peace. And what Keller said that was so fascinating is that he found in his experience as being an actual shepherd of sheep that the one thing above all things that would make an instant difference for the sheep in meeting these criteria was simply the presence of the shepherd. For example, um, being free from fear, if Keller showed up, the sheep, you could, he said he could almost watch them relax because they knew that the shepherd was there for their best interest and would even use force if necessary to defend them. He also knew that if he was there present with the sheep, that some of those friction ideas uh, would immediately go away that the sheep would tend to fight amongst themselves only when the shepherd was not present. Now, I think as you work through some of these ideas, you can see an almost immediate application to uh, having a good shepherd in our lives, uh, Jesus Christ, of course, who declared himself to be the good shepherd and the gate for the sheep. That our Lord Jesus gives us a freedom from fear uh, a freedom that, that brings us to our best selves so that we are not looking at the other sheep and causing friction among ourselves by uh, comparing ourselves to others or uh, you know, saying, well, I'm, I'm better than that sheep over there or I'm going to go take what that sheep has. Uh, those type of things tend to evaporate in the presence of the Good Shepherd. And of course, then the removal of pests and flies, the a cleansing element, there's a rather obvious application there as well that also is related to uh, being free from hunger. Our Lord as shepherd feeds us and he feeds us by leading us to these green pastures that he has cultivated specifically for our use and our feeding. Again, when we get to the portion that talks about being led in the path of righteousness, there's more to say on that point that I think you'll find interesting. But this is a great way to begin with a little extra background on what good shepherds do for their sheep. I think we can see why it would give a great joy for David to say, I shall not want, because the shepherd knows about green pastures. He knows the importance of still waters. And uh, the stillness there is gives us, as we hear these words and read them, uh, a sense of peace. You know, still waters, calm waters, a, a beautiful sort of setting. But uh, still water and, and fresh good water has a, another layer of meaning uh, when, when we are put in, in touch with what shepherds have to do. They, it's important for them to give their sheep fresh and good water because thirsty sheep will drink anything. They'll drink out of a stagnant pool, and it may not be just water that's in that stagnant pool. I won't say anything more than that at this point. Let's just say that sheep become very desperate for liquid, as any creatures do. And so part of this still waters is the understanding that it's fresh water and that it will give the proper living water to the sheep. And that's something that we've been considering as of late in a lot of our scripture readings this past Sunday. Uh, I attempted to make connections between the, the living water that Jesus talked about, uh, the Old Testament water issuing forth from the rock in the desert, and then at Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit being a kind of an extension of all of that. And, and just in, in a vivid, poetic sort of way, describing the spiritual dehydration and dryness and thirst 
that plagues humanity and how the gospel itself, the Holy Spirit, giving us and, and, and relaying to us the truth of the gospel of Jesus is as living water to thirsty souls. And so here again, we see that I shall not want as a sheep because I have the adequate water that I need and I have the, the place of green pasture where I will be fed and I can be at peace. I can lie down knowing that I am defended in every way by a good shepherd. In verse 3, we hear, He, that is the shepherd, Yahweh the shepherd, restores my soul. That's, uh, again, a very quick, it's easy to read those words and keep going, but let's just think about those for a moment. He restores my soul. And in the original language, the word that's there is open to interpretation so that he restores my soul, of course, is very valid and is a, a famous way of translating that word. It would also be correct to say he restores my life. You know, life and soul are obviously interrelated and connected to each other. Um, restores my life implies a, a physical element and side of things, whereas when, when we hear the word soul, we tend to associate that only with matters of the spirit. So taken together, it, the restoration is a complete restoration. It's that shalom peace, uh, which when you hear the word peace, especially in the Old Testament, and the word shalom is used, that is a, a holistic peace. That is a peace of both body and soul and mind. The whole person is what it's talking about. And here, again, using the 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 visual image of sheep, he restores me, he restores my life, he restores my soul. How does he do it? By leading me to these places where I can be fed and watered and defended. And that's, it all works together in the poetic image of the shepherd caring for sheep. Also, the word restoration or restores implies a comeback. You only restore something that has taken a beating. You know, if you restore furniture, that furniture has seen better days and you have to do some work. There's a lot of elbow grease involved in bringing that chair or side table back into its former glory. And that's what is underneath the idea of being restored. Uh, in this case, it's a sheep that may have uh, gotten a little bit sickly or uh, a problem that when you read Keller or if you know what it means to take care of sheep, you discover that uh, sheep are always dealing with illness or disease of one type or another. And you, uh, a good shepherd is always vigilant, checking the sheep, making sure that uh, they're not being afflicted by something. And if they are, applying the proper medicine. So restoration is most definitely a part of shepherding. And I think here, uh, from a spiritual perspective, it's easy for us to see how God is in the business of restoring us. And it's sort of a, a cyclical process. He's, in a sense, always restoring us, always applying the gospel to broken hearts, always sending his message of peace and spiritual health in Christ because the problems never cease coming. You know, even when our prayers are answered and we're delivered from one set of circumstances, another comes along and we're sort of right back to square one in some respects. And so the, the work of restoration is ongoing for us as God's people and as his sheep. That's why we need an ongoing diet of the word of God and the gifts that he offers uh, sacramentally to us. Uh, we can't go for long without them. But when we are continually in them, we are continuously being restored and brought back to the places where there is 
spiritual sustenance and rest, which is the whole idea that's being expressed here at as sheep were fed and watered and defended by the shepherd. Now, and as verse 3 continues, it says, He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Great stuff here for us, because it really all does flow from the shepherding main visual. You know, as we're holding that in our minds, as we encounter the text, being led is very much a feature of, of the shepherd to sheep relationship. And there are many pictures out there. All you have to do is do a Google image search of shepherd and sheep. And what you'll find is uh, hundreds and hundreds of pictures, uh, both in ancient cultures and in modern settings, where you'll see a shepherd out in front of a, a flock of sheep that is trailing along behind. It really does work that way. Uh, the, the Bible is not just selling you uh, an image to consider. It's based in fact that shepherd will, uh, a shepherd leads his sheep and the sheep follow. And so often that is tied into the idea of the sheep recognizing the voice of the shepherd. That they just won't follow anyone who shows up at the sheep pen. They will follow the one whose voice they know. At the very heart of this image is a very disarming fact and one that we can only embrace by faith. And that fact is, as sheep, we are being led and we need to be led. Left to our own devices, we will not do very well. Uh, We'll do more harm to ourselves than good. So at the heart of this this image of being a sheep in God's flock with Yahweh or with Jesus Christ as the good shepherd, the way that this works, the way that the image works is that I'm saying, if I embrace this image, I'm saying I'm a sheep and I need to be led. I need to be cared for. I can't do life myself or I'll ruin it all. And that's one of the the points that Keller brings up in his book, Uh, A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, when he writes specifically about this verse, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And this leading implies following, of course, but what it also implies and what it's talking about is being led from one place to another. And in the particular idea is being led from one pasture to another. Why is that important? Well, Keller says uh, something like this. I'm paraphrasing, but trying to stick close to his ideas. He writes, if left to themselves, sheep will follow the same trails in a pasture until they are deep ruts. If left to themselves, sheep will graze on beautiful manicured hills until they are desert. They'll eat all the grass, pull up everything by the root, and they'll pollute the, the, the ground that they're walking on. They need a shepherd that will lead them in a way that they don't deplete or ruin the pasture uh, that they are using to be fed and watered by. And, uh, you know, they'll they'll very quickly, if you just put sheep in a field, and that's the only place that they ever go, uh, they will eat up all the grass. And what happens after that? Well, malnutrition, disease sets in, uh, they're very quickly unhealthy. And so the, what's behind this idea of a shepherd leading sheep is that a truly good shepherd keeps the flock on the move, leading them skillfully from this pasture to that pasture so that uh, that the good, the pasture that was green in the first place is not depleted to the point where it's no longer useful. 
so that it can be renewed even as the sheep are feeding over there. So that it's good for the ground and it's good for the sheep to be moving and to be uh, following the, the voice of the shepherd, being led into new experiences. So if we, we look for application here, there's a couple ways that, and a couple things that we can say uh, that are being suggested by the poetry of the psalm. One is that as sheep, it's crucial that we follow the shepherd. It's not optional. Uh, and having said that, it only benefits us if we do follow the shepherd, because he is leading us to things that are new, things that will not only feed and water us and lead to us being defended, but will stretch us, will, will lead us into new opportunities for service, new areas that demand our attention as servants of Christ. And I think in many ways we see that happening even as the world is exploding around us, we are being led to new areas of service, uh, new things that we can do uh, to affect the bottom line in a positive way. Now they're all surrounding and utilizing the gospel message, the message of Jesus Christ. That's, that's a non-negotiable, that's at the heart of everything that we do, but how we do it, where we do it, what methods we use to broadcast this message are changing and shifting. And it's good for us. It's good that we don't tread the same path into a rut or eat the grass until it's all gone and, and now we're just standing on rocky ground. Uh, we need the shepherd to lead us into new places, new areas of service, and we can't help but do that when we follow the shepherd's voice. Also, the, just that language of leads me in paths of righteousness or ways of righteousness. Um, a, a way of, of looking at that idea, interpreting it, what that could mean is a, a way of living and believing that is consistent with maintaining a righteous relationship with God which is, uh, uh, requires some careful thinking from a Christian standpoint. Uh, the path of righteousness is not, here are 10 things, now go do them to the best of your ability. Uh, that's just a religion of law. The path of righteousness is first and foremost understanding yourself, using the language of the psalm, that we are shepherd that need care. If we try to live on our own, in the end that won't work well at all and will lead to our demise. If we're going to have an abundant life and not to mention hope for a life to come, we must depend on the shepherd to supply our needs, to take care of us, to give us what we need in order to do well. And that requires humility. That requires a baseline of uh, humility, uh, scriptural biblical humility, not thinking less of myself, but just realizing I can't do it by myself. I have to be given to. I have to be supplied with, including righteousness itself. My righteousness is a matter of wearing the righteousness that Christ has placed on me. It's his righteousness. It's not my own but it counts for me. And that's, that's a faith move that's based in humility. You know, a, a prideful person would never say, I need Jesus' righteousness because I can't manufacture my own. Pride makes war against that idea. Uh, it's only when the Holy Spirit breaks down our pride and our self-sufficiency that we become okay with the idea of saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a sheep in God's flock. I need him. To give to me or it's just not going to work. Also, he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Just real quickly, what that is touching on is the idea that 
And there's really two different ways we can look at this, and both can be, can be a both and, uh, both also true. One is that this very powerful idea of God's name, and I mentioned this at the beginning when we talked about the name Yahweh, I am who I am. Whenever we talk about God's name, packed into that idea and the concept of the name of God is God is acting. God's name is a way of talking about what God does, who he is. And that's why there's a, a, a commandment to not misuse it because it's a very powerful thing. God's name is packed full of who he is and his activity. After all, in the beginning, God created by speaking. This is all tied up with the idea of word and name. So he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake is kind of a way of saying that this is just what God does because of the power of his name. And of course, that's a name that you and I are attached to uh, through holy baptism. Uh, when the name of God was placed on us along with baptismal water is when everything happened. We were brought into the family of God, gifted with faith, uh, became a sheep in the flock, all of those things, all those initiations took place because of the water and the name of God. And so related to that, the sort of secondary idea is for his namesake means, in a sense, that there is a, a reputation involved. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake, in other words, to continue to show the world that this is what he does. Uh, he leads people in a path that leads to life and health. And for the sake of his good name being upheld, he continues to act in the best interests of his flock. So just a couple ways of looking at that there. Now, in what may be perhaps the most powerful portion of the psalm, although maybe it's not very useful to think of it in those terms, but in one that makes uh, this psalm so applicable in cases that are very critical, and I'm thinking here of at the hospital bedside, in the hospice room, uh, when somebody has been brought face to face with their own mortality, the mortality of a loved one, that's when these next words truly um, hit home in a new way. And that's where it says in verse 4, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Extremely powerful. And perhaps the most needed words for us today. Certainly, as I was preparing for today, this is where I kept going the most, just in my own personal study and in the way that the words were addressing my thoughts and my feelings. Were, were Verse 4 in particular and verse 5, even though I am threatened in the, the most uh, fundamental way that a person or a sheep, in this case, can be threatened. I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Now, a key shift happens in the language of the psalm right here. And I'll talk about that in just a second. But the even though, in verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, just those two words, sets up a very, very important sort of uh, underlying expectation. And the even though means, it, what is setting up is that there's something that can balance out the threat. It's a threat. It's real. It's potentially terrifying. It's not to diminish the threat in any way, but, all, but also at the same time to say there's something that I'm moving to that outweighs the deadly threat. Even though it's happening, I must go through it. There are things that I know that offset the terror and enable me to adopt a certain mindset and orientation of the heart. 
and that is the presence of the shepherd. The presence of the shepherd and the tools that are at his disposal to help. In verse 4, just uh, as an aside, most, most English translations that I'm aware of say something to the effect of, I will fear no evil. And in a sense, there's a, a predictive quality to that. Uh, the assumption is, typically, walking through the valley of the shadow of death seems like a very specific experience. And since I'm probably not there quite yet, since I'm still alive, we'll phrase that in terms of, I will fear no evil. You know, the will being sort of uh, holding off until that happens. That's one of the ways of, of interpreting this. And it's certainly valid, and it, it, it holds true. There is a predictive quality to this. Make no mistake. But the emphasis of the original language, if we were to translate this in a very literal sense, then the English would read like, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not fear evil. And see, that brings it right into the present, rather than simply say, when the time comes for me to go through the valley, I will fear no evil then. The original language hold, certainly holds the door open to that, but it also is very helpful in saying, my trust in the shepherd allows me to say, right now, in the face of things that threaten me, I do not fear evil. And there's an active quality to that that I find extremely encouraging. That whether death is a long ways away or very imminent as a human being, I have no idea. I tend to think of death in terms of a later on type thing, but it may not be. And since that's the case, what this psalm is saying truly is that because the shepherd goes through me, through whatever danger I face on a daily basis, I do not fear evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So yes, there's a predictive element to this. When the time comes for me to pass away, I will fear no evil. But there's also an assertion of this truth for right now. The presence of the shepherd enables me to say, I do not fear evil because he is there and he has the tools that are needed to defend me. Also, as we've talked about the fearless prayers of the Psalms, one of the things that I've mentioned is that the, the Psalms equip us with a great deal of things to use to speak to ourselves, self-talk, if you will, or simply gospel, uh, gospel handles to grab onto so that as we are praying, we are also actively reminding ourselves of what God has said. You know, and the Psalms are constantly giving us the permission to feel what we feel, to express what we feel, but also then to remind ourselves of what God has said and what he has done. So that not only are we speaking what, are we, what we are feeling, but we're also talking to ourselves about the truth, God's truth, what he has told us again and again is the case. So that these two things are coming together, the expression of our feeling and the expression of what we believe, what we've been told by God. And that part of our prayer life is meant to be reminding ourselves so that we can use these words of the 23rd Psalm. My point is, we can use these words as a way of talking to ourselves using what God has said. In other words, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though Death and threat and violence is all around. I do not fear evil because the shepherd is with me. And here's the subtle, wonderful, meaningful shift that happens with just a, a very small tweaking of language. If you'll notice, you go back up through the psalm. Up to this point, all the language has been in terms of 
Yahweh, the Lord, is my shepherd. He makes me lie down. He leads me. He restores me. He leads me in paths of righteousness. But did you notice the shift here? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I do not fear evil, for you are with me. Do you notice that? The language shifts from he to you. So David, in the flow of this psalm, has stopped talking about the shepherd and has started talking to the shepherd. And so you just have this wonderful personalized, you know, it's a personalization, taking it from a concept to a relationship. I do not fear evil because you, good shepherd, are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. So just so subtle, but so deeply important. And I think maybe this is one of the places where we truly do, because of the language, and it may be just a, a subconscious thing, but because of the language shifting into this close relationship, this reliance on a, you are with me, rather than he is with me, now it's, you are with me, I fear no evil, your rod and staff, they comfort me. Now it's become personal. So why would a sheep be comforted by the rod and staff of a shepherd? Good questions. And uh, this is, I have used these sort of images in sermons, in particular in funeral sermons. And it's, it's always been really uh, kind of fascinating to see people react to this. And they'll come up to me afterwards and say, wow, I, you know, I never thought about that in that way before. Uh, and that's because of the, the concentration on the rod and the staff of the shepherd. And those are two different things. Uh, sometimes we may conflate the two into one, but they're really two different objects. Uh, the rod, on one hand, would have been a, a, a kind of a, a club, if you will. It would have been uh, very uh, finely uh, polished by the shepherd, uh, taken from a root. It would have been whittled down uh, into a, a very precise shape with sort of a club on the end. And shepherds in the ancient world, and still in the modern world today, from what I understand, I, I, this is something that Philip Keller writes about as well, uh, a shepherd would be very skilled as, at using this rod, especially for defending his flock against predators. And shepherds could become very highly skilled at throwing the rod. Uh, almost like, uh, well, uh, you see people who are able to throw clubs or axes and, or knives and get that exactly where they want it to go. Uh, a shepherd could become highly skilled at seeing a predator approaching the flock and, you know, being able to throw it and hit the predator and send it scurrying away. As a sheep, you can see how that would help to alleviate the fear, knowing that your shepherd has a tool that he can use to send evil running away. And I think at a, a deep level, we understand that just the presence of God is enough to send evil running. But we think of the special gifts of things like God's word that convey God's power and his promises as being one of those tools that gives us peace, allows us to rest and even look death in the face and not fear evil because the shepherd, we know, can use that rod to, to get the predator and, and send the predator running. There's also secondary uses for the rod that have to do with guidance of the sheep. There, the, the rod would not be thrown, but just used as a way of nudging the sheep to, you know, go this way or go that way. The other thing, and probably the most famous image of a, an object that we associate with the shepherd, is the staff. Your rod and your staff. And it's the staff that is the one that we think of that has the crook in the end. And today, we, we almost exclusively think of that in comedic terms. 
you know, where a, if somebody's going on for too long, a shepherd's staff appears and hooks around the person and pulls them off of the stage, out of the spotlight, away from the microphone. Um, although that's kind of a funny image, that's not far off from the use, or one of the uses at least, of the shepherd's staff. Because of the crook in the end, it is uniquely formed to fit around a sheep so that it's able to, uh, a shepherd is able to fit that around a sheep or a lamb and lift them to where they need to go. One of the examples that Keller uses is of lifting, you know, if a, a lamb somehow became separated from its mother, he could use the staff to fit around the lamb and lift it over to where the mother is without touching the lamb, without getting his scent on the lamb, which might be a problem. Also, uh, a shepherd's staff could be used if a, a sheep got stuck in brambles or thorns. The, the staff shape could be used to try to gently pry them out of that sticky situation. And in a similar fashion, if there was a, a, a sheep that was close to a dangerous drop-off or chasm, a ditch, for example, or a cliff, the, again, the, the shepherd could just fit that end around the sheep and pull them to safety. Uh, there are many documented cases of sheep following each other off of cliffs. Uh, one tries to jump over a ditch and doesn't quite make it. That doesn't stop the next one from attempting the same thing. And so a shepherd can prevent all of that by hooking the staff around the sheep and gently guiding them to safety. There's one other way that staffs could sometimes be used by shepherds, and that is in inspecting the sheep, especially for disease and uh, for illness. They, the staff could be used to separate the wool and sort of lift it aside, and the shepherd uses his other hand to do so, uh, to quickly look for any signs of scab or other skin diseases that seem to be prevalent among sheep. So all of that is to say that the, as the sheep considers you are with me, it's both the presence of the shepherd and the tools that the shepherd knows how to use that enables the sheep to say in the face of danger and even death, I do not fear evil. I know that my shepherd has my best interest in mind and will use the, the tools at his disposal to defend and serve me and get me to where I need to go. Th those are words to dwell on today. And I invite you to do that. When we talked about Psalm 1, we talked about the art of Christian meditation being not emptying our minds, but filling our minds. And I would strongly suggest that you fill your mind today with Psalm 23, in particular, verses, or verse 4, this idea of, I do not fear evil, the shepherd is with me, you are with me, good shepherd, your rod and your staff comfort me. You know how to defend me, you know how to keep me safe. That's not the entire psalm, though. There's a transition that takes place in verse 5, where I think we can rightly understand that perhaps we're not thinking in terms of sheep any longer, although there are a number of these images that do work in both of these worlds. But all of a sudden, I am coming up out of the valley of the shadow of death to whatever it is that is next, and that's framed in terms of a feast. In verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Now, the, again, understanding we're dealing with poetry here, so there's a use of contrasts that would seem to be uh, not necessarily indicative of what the eternal feast will be like. I say that because of the presence of enemies would seem to suggest you know, there's not going to be enemies who are against me or God in heaven. But what this is saying is that 
I am being honored. I am being served while my enemies watch. Uh, the Lord is giving me more than enough at his table. Now, some commentators do suggest that the language of this is such that it could be talking about uh, the, the presence of former enemies, in which case it could be talking about the kingdom uh, in the life of the world to come. You can do with that what you will, but the point is that a table has been set at which I'm being fed and being anointed, which is an action that conveys great honor. I've seen all sorts of things relating to this reference in various commentaries. Uh, some comment, uh, commentators say that the anointing was something that would have been um, traditionally done at a great feast uh, where guests as they arrived would be anointed with oil. It was a symbol of gladness uh, that make the face shine uh, with your smile. Uh, also, we know, of, it's a matter of scriptural record, that kings and great prophets were anointed with oil as a way of physically setting them apart for their service, uh, just a, a visual way of showing this person has been selected. In any event, it conveys uh, a great honor, uh, uh, being set apart being elevated by God's invitation and brought into a, a setting of great blessing. Keller adds a little shade of meaning in A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by indicating that a, a linseed oil mix is and has been used on real sheep for the purpose of soothing them uh, if they're bitten by flies or uh, in some cases, it even linseed oil and a mixture of other things helps to act as a, a, a skin or a, a disease that uh, sheep would carry on their surface. That oil worked in that way as well, the cleansing and removing imperfection from the sheep. So yeah, it's fascinating. I think that these things are all sort of relaying to one another with the idea of the application of oil and the anointing that takes place and the overflowing cup, you know, uh, simply being a, a ex exceeding generosity, uh, more than enough is being poured out at this table of celebration. And then the, the psalm concludes, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a train going on in Psalm 23, because if you recall earlier on, he leads me in paths of righteousness, and now something is following me. It is goodness and mercy, and it is it, these qualities uh, there, are, there are qualities that ultimately and first belong to God. You know, we can definitely say of God that he is goodness. He is mercy. And here the qualities of goodness and mercy are being personified as living things that are following me. And the, the thrust of the original language is a little more active, actually, than just following me and takes on the, um, uh, the implication of pursuit or these things are chasing me. Goodness and mercy are, are chasing after me in a very active way. And that is, that is just so comforting for us to consider that as we are on this pilgrimage that we call life, following after our shepherd that we are hemmed in. In other words, we have a shepherd going on before us, leading us, and we have his qualities bringing up the rear, kind of chasing us, and those qualities are goodness and mercy. And almost you get the sense of them propelling us forward uh, if we should linger too long on you know, looking around at the, the dark valley of the shadow, getting too frightened by what we see 
the goodness and the mercy are, are impelling us to keep on going after the shepherd. And then finally, of course, the, what's at the end of the journey is living in the house of the Lord forever. There is a now and a not yet to the, the conclusion of this psalm, you know, that I think maybe instinctively we pick up on, but I think that it's worth touching on uh, before, we con before we close here. And when you, when you think about holding some of these images together, the image of a table being set where there is a type of anointing happening, there's a cup, table with a cup and goodness and mercy and being in the house of the Lord, it's hard not to think about worship. And there is a now and a not yet to all Christian worship and the worship of God's people of every era. Right now, when God's people gather for worship, we are being given goodness and mercy and the forgiveness purchased by the Good Shepherd who laid down on the rod of the cross to forgive our sins. There's a now to that. Right now we can say, I do not fear evil because Jesus is present. But there's also a not yet. You know, we're, we're not yet fully in the kingdom Evil is not completely eradicated yet. We, as, as it stands, we're still on our journey. So not yet are we fully into the house of the Lord where Jesus has prepared rooms for us. So we're still making our way. And worship, in that sense, is a sneak preview. It's coming attractions. Uh, the, it's a, in our own liturgies, we say that it's a foretaste of the feast to come. That it, even as what we are being given in worship is truly heavenly food, it's also preparing us for the ultimate fulfillment of that down the line at the time that is perfect and that God has set for his people. And that should be something that brings us great comfort and helps to underscore how sacred our worship activity really is. It is in truth connecting us, preparing us for heavenly worship where the presence of God is the beating heart of that experience as well. I am quite certain that there are more and more hours that we could spend on the 23rd Psalm Hopefully this has unearthed a couple things for you to think about and use devotionally to use in your life of prayer. Once again, I would strongly recommend that in all of the ways that it's potentially of use to you, that you would concentrate on verse 4 that talks about, I will fear no evil, I do not fear evil, for you, shepherd, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Let's close with a word of prayer. Good shepherd, open our eyes to see your blessing. Open our ears to hear your voice. Open our hearts that we may love you. Teach us to look to your rod and your staff your strong arm, your sacrificial love. You are indeed the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. Your words of comfort and protection are not empty words. You proved it all by going to the cross in order for us who could not save ourselves, who could not defend ourselves. And you suffered death you suffered abandonment on the cross so that we would never be abandoned, so that we would never be fully punished for sin, but would live instead in green pastures, in quiet waters, fed at your table with a cup of overflowing blessing. Speak your peace to us today, Lord Jesus. And our simple prayer is that we would then be instruments of peace 
in our world today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me for another look at the Psalms. And we'll continue looking at more fearless prayers next week. One more time, I just wanted to say that the resource that I drew on today is a short book entitled A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23 by Philip Keller, K-E-L-L-E-R. If you want to pick that up and make use of it in your own devotional life, uh, you may want to do so. So it's been great uh, to be connected to you in this way today around God's word. And may all of us as sheep in God's fold be able to say, as we look to our shepherd and Lord, I do not fear evil, for you are with me. May his peace be with you.